So I would start by acknowledging um, the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people and the Kalin of the Kalin Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. All right, so today it's really a great pleasure to introduce um, the Wednesday seminar speaker, Max Brennan. And she did her PhD um, in my lab under the supervision of Gemma, Andreas, and myself. So Mark started um, as a Europe student at WeHi in 2013, so quite a long time ago. And then she decided to stay on and um, do her honors and PhD thesis as well. <laughs> From the very start, it was obvious that Marx is not only a great scientist, but she's also a great person. And it's been an absolute pleasure working with her in the past five years. She has looked after and mentored so many students and staff, which has come not only through my lab, but also the whole of WeHi. <laughs> and importantly, over the years, she has learned to cope with the really bad dad jokes Andreas and I always make, <laughs> and just like dads do in any family. But however, Marx realized pretty quickly that we are indeed all family, as you can see in this picture. <laughs> And as reiterated by Mark's comment, that awkward moment when you look like the love child of your supervisors. <laughs> so, all jokes aside, there's of course lots of great things to say about Marx as a scientist. She's passionate, intelligent, hardworking, and she always stays extremely calm even when things become really hectic. This is reflected in her contributions to multiple co-author publications in Nature, such as Nature and others, and recently most excitingly highlighted with her first, first author paper in Blood, and of which Marx will talk about in the first part of this presentation today. All in all, Marx is an exceptional student, and we really see a lot of potential for her future. So the exciting work she will talk about today is really just the start for her and we are excited to see how her future scientific career develops. Welcome, Max. Uh, thank you all for coming to my talk today, and thanks, Marco, for that very generous introduction. Um, and I'd also like to extend my appreciation for allowing me to show my work in the Wednesday seminar series today. Oops. Okay, so during my PhD, I have really been working on two quite contrasting projects. Uh, one was about HECD-1, which is an E3 ligase, and I'm going to discuss its role in normal hematopoiesis. But first, I'm going to talk about uh, the MCL1 project, and this is probably something a little bit more familiar to you all, um, as MCL1 is an apoptotic regulator, and I'm going to discuss targeting it in hematopoietic malignancies. So apoptosis, or programmed cell death, is a fundamental process uh, used by multicellular organisms during development, and I've just put this classic um, uh, digit formation. And furthermore, um, it's really important in tissue homeostasis. So here we have a white blood cell, and in the minute that I've been talking to you, you've made about 100,000 of these cells, along with about 4 million red blood cells. And so as new cells are made, old cells must die. And this is a classic uh, morphology of an apoptotic cell with the blebbing, which maintains all the cellular de debris so it doesn't elicit uh, an inflammation response. So when I'm thinking about apoptosis, I'm thinking about it on a molecular level and what's happening inside the cell. Um, and in particular, MCL1 works in the intrinsic apoptotic pathway which relies on the balance of these three proteins, the pro-survival proteins, um, the pro-apoptotic BH3-only proteins, as well as back and backs, the pro-apoptotic effectors. And it's really back and backs that um, activation that's the point of no return for apoptosis to go ahead. Uh, and under steady state, the pro-survival proteins keep back and backs in check, but the cells can respond to um, cellular stresses, such as DNA damage, by upregulation of the BH3-only proteins. Um, and then these proteins can um, inhibit the pro-survivals and uh, skew the system towards apoptosis. And the reason why we're interested in apoptosis is because it's often deregulated in uh, cancer. And if you're not familiar with Hanahan and Weiberg's uh, hallmarks of cancer, these are all the attributes a cell must acquire to become malignant. And as you can see here, resisting cell death is one of them. 
And uh, as such, uh, over recent years, there's been the advent of BH3 mimetic drugs, um, and this new class of drugs work by activating apoptosis. So they do this by directly inhibiting the pro-survival proteins um, by behaving like BH3-only proteins, hence the name BH3 mimetics. So when these bind the pro-survival proteins, this skews the pathway towards apoptosis. Now, MCL1 is a pro-survival protein, and um, the BH3 mimetics that you're probably used to hearing about, like venetoclax or nevidoclax, do not target MCL1. Um, but there's been a lot of interest in targeting MCL1 in cancer because, firstly, we know uh, the genomic region where MCL1 is located is amplified somatically in many human tumor types. And additionally, in an uh, enormous uh, amount of preclinical models of uh, hematological malignancies, we know MCL1 contributes to the survival of these cells, and it's also been shown in a few uh, solid tumors as well. Uh, and this is probably shown um, quite nicely in the EMU-MIC model of Burkitt lymphoma, um, which was uh, generated by Jerry in the uh, 80s. And this, um, this tumor model is driven by overexpression of the CMIC gene in B cells to um, result in lymphoma. And Gemma showed more recently that if you take uh, wild-type EMU-MIC, um, sorry, P53 sufficient EMU mix cell lines, and you delete even just one allele of MCL1, that these tumors can no longer grow in vivo. So this just shows that MCL1 is really important for the survival of many tumor cells. So excitingly, a few years ago now, Servier developed the first um, clinically relevant um, inhibitor for MCL1. Um, and this was published a couple of years ago, and um, they entered into a collaboration with WeHi, a number of labs of WeHi, to uh, push this drug through preclinical work. So during this time, if we go back to the EMU-MIC mouse model, you can see that if you treat uh, these tumors in vivo, that you, get, uh, you can cure about 70% of these mice. And I'll just show one more bit of data from this paper, that is that um, a human... Uh, multiple myeloma cell line, uh, if you transplant these into NSG mice um, and treat with uh, S63845, uh, you get really nice tumor regression, and this was a dose response, um, in dose response manner with the vehicle here in black. So MCL1 is important in cancer, but it's also really important in a lot of normal tissues, and I've just picked a handful of papers here showing MCL1 importance in um, hematological populations, but also in solid tissues. And of note, uh, genetic loss of MCL1 in cardiomyocytes can lead to heart failure in mice. So it was always a huge concern about targeting MCL1 in, um, in, uh, as a therapeutic agent. Um, perhaps it would be too toxic. But surprisingly, when you treated mice with this drug, um, there was very little toxicity, and the, the biggest cell loss we saw was uh, loss of B cells in the bone marrow, um, and most uh, other cell types remained undisturbed. But there is one caveat to this data, and that is that um, S63045 has a higher affinity for the human protein uh, compared to the mouse protein, as shown in this binding assay. And this is recapitulated when you look at the IC50 values from different cell lines that are human. So the Burkitt lymphoma cell lines, IC50s are some five times lower than the IC50 seen in the emu mix cell lines. So the question was, are we underestimating the efficacy of this drug? And perhaps more importantly, maybe we're underestimating the toxicity of this drug in healthy tissues. So to answer this question, um, Marco designed a humanized MCO1 mouse. Um, and here I've just got a schematic of the mouse and human loci, um, and we have the coding exons, one, two, three, with the interspersing um, intronic regions in the five prime and three prime untranslated regions. And so to generate this mouse, we took uh, the human uh, coding regions and interspersing intronic regions and knocked it into the mouse locus while maintaining the five prime and three prime UTR. And so the idea was that we would get expression of the human protein but still maintain all of the mouse regulatory regions. So this brings me to the aims of um, this first project. And while what our ultimate goal was to identify toxicities and efficacies, we first needed to characterize human MCL1 and make sure that the human protein could sufficiently uh, replace the mouse protein. And this was no small thing, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it. Um, first of all, homozygous loss of MCL1 is embryonic lethal, and they die very early during development before implantation. 
And also uh, small aberration or small changes to the locus um, can have deleterious effects. So MCL1 flox mice um, are sterile, uh, likely due to the protein being more stable. And also, even though MCL1 heterozygous mice are viable, um, they have um, reduced, they can't recover as well with 5-FU, which is a chemotherapy agent, or with um, sublethal irradiation. So really, we needed to get the expression of human MCL1 just right. So my uh, humanized MCL1 mice were viable, um, so MCL1 seemed to be uh, expressed well. If you take heterozygous crosses, you can see that they're um, born in the typical Mendelian ratios with equal numbers of males and females. And uh, furthermore, if, uh, just showing this western blot of thymocytes, you can see that the human MCL1 is expressed, um, and as you can see, it's a little bit larger than the mouse protein here. So I told you MCL1 is really important in uh, a lot of blood tissues. So in characterizing these mice, I did extensive fax analysis of the lymph lymphoid organs, and I'm just going to show a couple of things here. So firstly, uh, B cell development in the bone marrow, as shown by IgM and B220 cell surface expression. Um, and they start off as immature cells here and kind of increase in maturity following this horseshoe shape. And there was no difference in uh, the relative frequencies uh, or the total cell numbers of these populations. Similarly, in the thymus, um, you can look at T cell development by CD4 and CD8 expression. So you have double negative immature thymocytes uh, progress to double positive CD4, CD8 thymocytes before exiting as CD4 and CD8 um, mature T cells. And again, there was no difference between the frequency or the total cell number of, um, of these populations. So to test the um, function of MCL1 in vivo, we uh, treated these mice with 5-FU, and as you can see, the heterozygous mice uh, come down uh, much more quickly or have a less likelihood to survive, as was what Alex showed earlier, uh, and compared to the wild type in red. But as you can see, the humanized mice, um, they behave the same as wild type. So to look a bit more at the functionality of MCL1, uh, we thought it was possible that other members of the BCL2 family could be compensating for a different expression of MCL1. So we looked at um, the expression in splenocytes as well as thymocytes of other BCL2 family members. Uh, and as you can see, the ones that we looked at, so BCL2, BIM, A1, Puma, and BCLXL were uh, expressed at similar levels between the humanized uh, MCL1 cells and the wild type. And this is just quantified over multiple Western blots. So then we became interested in whether MCL1 could bind the mouse proteins as well. So we know MCL1 has to bind the BH3 only pro proteins to inhibit apoptosis. Um, and they also, uh, about 70% of MCL1 uh, is at the mitochondria inhibiting back. Uh, mostly, and also backs. So now we have mice that have the human protein, and we don't really know if they can uh, inhibit or bind as well uh, to the mouse versions of the other BCL2 family members. So we did two experiments to answer this. Firstly, I took thymocytes from um, uh, both humanized and wild-type mice, and then just gave them to Grant, and he did an IP for MCL1. So we, um, on the left here, you can see the whole cell lysate, so the starting material, um, and he pulled down MCL1 and uh, probed for uh, BIM and BAC, and if you look down each lane, you can see the relative uh, frequencies are uh, equal between the human and the mouse uh, expressing proteins, expressing cells. Um, so then I did some microscopy, which also was not my expertise, but I took mice, um, I made mice dermal fibroblast uh, with the help of Najwa and Nima, who gave me some uh, protocols and reagents, um, and then Kate gave me a really good staining protocol, and John helped me take these uh, images at the microscope. So you can see here in um, yellow is the DAPI staining the nucleus. Mitotracker is a dye that stains the uh, mitochondria. Uh, and then we probed for MCL1. And if you look at the merge, you can see that they uh, overlay quite nicely. And more importantly, there's no difference between the cells expressing human MCL1 compared to the, the cells expressing mouse MCL1. So um, the last thing I'll show you is um, how these cells respond to cytotoxic stimuli. So, um, we took thymocytes and I um, um, 
used different cytotoxic stimuli and looked at their death over time. And you can see between the wild type and the humanized MCO1 thymocytes, there is no difference in the rate or the amount um, of death seen. But what was interesting was if we treat with the MCL1 inhibitor, we start to see that the humanized MCL1 uh, thymocytes are a bit more sensitive. Uh, we also did this with B cells. So again, just looking at a topicide, there was no difference in um, the amount of killing. But if you um, treat with the MCL1 inhibitor, now at very low doses at this short time point, these cells are much more sensitive to the drug. And this just tells us that um, the um, the higher frequency or higher affinity for the drug to the human protein is relevant in these cells. Oops. Okay, so um, next I wanted to talk about the potential toxicities um, before talking about the efficacy of the drug in vivo. So now, um, previously it had been shown that uh, mice, healthy black sick mice, uh, the maximum tolerated dose was 40 mg per kg, um, and 25 mg per kg was the dose where we saw um, killing of tumor cells in vivo. So I took black sick mice, uh, and you can see with the vehicle or 25 mg per kg that these mice can um, deal with this treatment. Uh, but if we take the humanized mice and we treat with the same dose, these mice um, do not tolerate the drug at this dose. So we um, reduced the dose from 20 to 15, uh, and eventually at 12.5 mg per kg, um, we reliably saw uh, the drug being tolerated in these mice in vivo. So to look at the effects uh, at this dose, um, after treatment, I took um, mice to look at the acute effects shortly after uh, treatment, and then a couple of, uh, couple of weeks later to look at the recovery. And to cut a long story short, this um, made, we got a lot of data out of these experiments, but really what we saw um, was a lack of B cells in the bone marrow, and you can see the wild type in red vehicle treated compared to drug treated, there's a significant drop, and that this is much more um, marked in the humanized MCR1 mice. But two weeks later, uh, these cell populations are largely recovered. And again, I looked at many other cell types that were largely unaffected. Uh, looking in the solid tissues, we did histology, and I'm just showing the humanized MCL1 mice at day three post-treatment, uh, vehicle along the top and uh, drug treated along the bottom, and there were no um, differences that we could see between uh, the two treatment arms. So now we get to ask the question if we can cure cancer in this model. So uh, we have, <laughs> we turn to the MIC model of um, uh, Burkitt lymphoma again, and if I crossed the uh, emu-mic transgene onto a humanized MC1 background, and if there was less um, MC1 expression, you might see a survival curve like this, uh, which is uh, what happens when you have just one allele of MC1, you get a delayed tumor onset, or conversely, with uh, increased MC1 expression, you, um, the tumors come down much more quickly. But for all the genotypes, um, for the wild types in my colony, as well as the heterozygous and humanized MC01 mice, the primary tumor latency was um, comparable uh, and all within the expected 120 days. So I made cell lines from these tumors and um, tested um, their um, sensitivity to the drug in vitro. And you can see in red, all the humanized MC01 lines were much more sensitive with lower IC50s compared to um, the mouse, um, the ones expressing mouse MC01. So you can look at this data a little bit differently and um, combine them to do average IC50 curves. And you can see the uh, IC, average IC50 for the humanized lines is 25 nanomolar compared to 160, so some six or seven times more sensitive. <coughs> And this recapitulates quite nicely what I showed you earlier, uh, the IC50 of the human cell line. So now we have um, a mouse model that is expressing human MCL1 that's behaving like human cells in vitro. So we wanted to move um, in vivo, so we took these cell lines um, and we transplanted them into humanized MCL1 mice. 
treated them with at the maximum tolerated dose of 12.5 mg per kg, and this allowed us to examine the lymphoma regression as well as the tolerability, tolerability of the drug in the, in the same model. Um, and what we saw was at the maximum tolerated dose, we could cure 70% of mice. Um, so after we transplant lymphoma cells, this is with five consecutive doses at 12.5 mg per kg. So this is at the maximum tolerated dose, and we wanted to see if we could improve uh, the therapeutic window um, of this uh, inhibitor. So we decided to uh, combine the treatment with uh, cyclophosphamide. So cyclophosphamide is a commonly used chemotherapy agent. It's widely used uh, to treat a number of tumors. Um, it's very cheap, and as such, it's listed on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. And a general dose in mice is uh, about 150 uh, mg per kg. So um, I desi designed a treatment regime where we transplant the cells, we do a suboptimal dose, a single dose of cyclophosphamide, and then we reduce the dose of S63845 to 7.5 mg per kg, but still at five consecutive doses. So what you see here is uh, the vehicle, which all come down at around three weeks as expected. As single agents, S63845 at 7.5 mg per kg and uh, cyclophosphamide in purple give about 40% um, tumor-free survival. Um, but when we combine the treatment, we, uh, we could see that almost 100% of these mice were cured. And I have some evidence to show that we can go even lower with the dose of S63845. So hopefully, just to summarize this part, I've shown you that we've developed this tool that we think will be really important for assessing MCL1 inhibitors in preclinical models in the future. And as such, uh, these mice will be made available to the scientific community um, and will also not just be important for S63845, but for other MCO1 inhibitors. Uh, and this is uh, Amgen's compound, which they just published a couple of months ago. And as you can see, this, they have, it has the same phenomena where the, um, the compound binds much more tightly to the human compared to mouse, and in this case, some 700 times more. So um, I also showed you that combining the therapy with cyclophosphamide really increased the therapeutic window. Um, so I think moving forward, understanding rational combination therapies for different tumor types will be key. And in our own lab, these are the uh, models that we've already crossed onto a humanized MCL1 background, um, and we'll work on those in the future. Uh, but of note, we've uh, backcrossed this uh, allele onto an NSG background. So uh, this means that we can now do uh, human tumors in a grass um, in NSG mice. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about something completely different. <laughs> So if you've been asleep, then you're, none of what I said is required knowledge for the future part of my talk. <laughs> um, HECD1 is an E3 ligase. Um, and I started working on this project in honours. Um, and at that time, we thought it regulated A1, which was a pro-survival protein like MCL1. But I, we showed that that was probably not the case. And we've also had a few other hypotheses about this protein over the years. But it's only been recently, probably in just over the last year and a half, where we've started getting a handle on what it might be doing. Um, and that's the data I'm going to show you today. So HECD1, like I said, it's an E3 ubiquitin ligase, which means what it does is attach ubiquitin to substrates in this pathway. So it involves the E1 enzymes uh, and E2 uh, enzymes, and once an E2 is loaded with a ubiquitin, it can physically bind with an E3 ligase, which brings into close proximity um, a specific substrate uh, that can um, result in the ubiquitination of said substrate. Uh, and this results in monoubiquitination. Um, you can also get subsequent reactions that result in a polyubiquitin chain. And here I'm just showing the lysine 48 chain, which is a classic mark to target substrates to the 26S proteasome and uh, degrade the protein. Uh, there's also um, the well-studied K63, which is involved in signaling, um, but there are other non-canonical um, non -canonical chains that can be made. But really the point I'm trying to make with this slide is that the, the function of an E3 ligase really depends on what its substrate's doing, um, what the substrate of the job is, and also what, um, what chain is made. 
So in the literature, there have been a few substrates reported for HECD1, and most of them have to do with um, the regulation of cell migration. And as such, more recently, it was shown uh, that HECD1 could act as a negative regulator of the epith epithelial mesenchymal transition um, in a mouse model of uh, metastasis. So uh, HECD1 is embryonic lethal. So it was first described by Irene in 2007, where she was looking for uh, neural tube defects uh, doing this ENU mutagenesis screen. And she identified this mutant, which they called open mind, uh, and this mapped back to the HECD1 locus. And as you can see, it results in exencephaly um, with 100% penetrance and is embryonic lethal. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so when we became interested in HECD1, we generated our own mouse, and this was before the Magic CRISPR lab. So this uh, mouse was made by uh, UCOM, and we got a targeted allele from them, and this has a LAC-Z reporter and a neomycin selection cassette. So I crossed these mice to FLIPase uh, expressing animals to um, remove the selection cassette, uh, and this results in a flox allele. And then I crossed these mice to uh, the black six deleters, and uh, this removed this critical exon to uh, give the knockout allele, and it's this, um, this mouse that I'm talking about today. So as shown in the literature previously, um, HECD1, homozygous loss of HECD1 is embryonic lethal, and I got no mice at weaning. Uh, however, I looked at E14.5, and these mice um, are still at Mendelian ratios at this stage. But what was interesting on a black six background, previously those mice were on a C3H background. Uh, on a black six, we'd see a reduced penetrance of HECD1, uh, of exencephaly. So, um, we had some HECD1 with exencephaly and some without. Uh, and this equated to about 50%. Uh, we started to look at whether this was uh, sex-linked, um, and my N numbers are low, but it is uh, leaning towards um, being fe uh, biased towards females, which is not uncommon for exencephaly. Um, but we weren't exactly interested in following up uh, HECD1's role in embryogenesis, because this had been published. What we were really interested in was what HECD1 was doing in adult tissues, and we knew that HECD1 was expressed from the in, in hematological um, populations because, through the InGen database. Um, so we decided to ask the question, what role does HECD1 play in the hematopoietic system? Uh, and to answer this question, I did uh, stem cell reconstitution uh, experiments. So this is uh, the experimental setup, and most of the data I'll show you from here on in is variations on this theme. So HECD1 embryonic lethal, so to generate knockouts, we uh, set up heterozygous crosses, timed heterozygous crosses, and then we can generate E14 embryos and isolate their fetal livers, um, which are a rich source of hematopoietic stem cells. And then we can transplant them into lethally irradiated uh, mice. Uh, and transplanting fresh HSCs will uh, rescue these mice from lethality. Um, and then we can let them sit for eight to 10 weeks. And what we have is a wild type mouse with HECD1 loss just in the um, blood cells. So I just did uh, fax analysis of the different lymphoid organs to see if uh, HECD1 loss made, um, resulted in any perturbations in the cell types of the blood. And again, I'm just going to show a couple of things. So uh, here we have, again, the IgM B220 expression to look at bone marrow development. And there was no difference in uh, the frequencies or total numbers of these cell populations. Uh, and similarly, in the thymus, using CD4 and CD8 expression, there were no differences in the uh, frequencies or the uh, total cell numbers. So um, essentially, HECD1 loss meant that they could, mice could still be reconstituted, and that was fine. There was very few differences in um, populations. So then we moved on to do a competitive reconstitution, and uh, this can sometimes reveal more subtle phenotypes not uh, shown in a um, straight reconstitution. 
So how this is set up is, again, we generate HECD1 knockout uh, fetal livers. But this time, before transplanting them, we mix them at a one-to-one -one ratio with wild-type cells or our competitor cells, and then transplant them into wild-type uh, irradiated mice. And then we can follow the um, ratio of these cells in different populations over time. As a control, you also um, do wild-type and wild-type together. So again, I let them sit for eight to 10 weeks and then did fax analysis of the different uh, cell types uh, to look at this, how this ratio was maintained over time. So this is what the data looks like. Um, you have, uh, with the controls, so you have your wild-type competitors with wild-type. Uh, you can see that the competitors, which express CD45.1, uh, compared to uh, the wild-type uh, test cells that are about one-to-one -one ratio. But what was really striking um, is that HECD1, uh, when transplanted with wild-type cells, HECD1 deficient cells contributed very little to, um, to the, the pool of cells. And here I'm just showing uh, B cells in the blood, but you can um, plot these values for different populations. And here I'm just showing uh, MAC1, GR1 positive cells, which are granulocytes in the myeloid lineage, uh, and then B cells and T cells in the lymphoid lineage. So in all these populations, HECD1 was outcompeted. So this made us think maybe HECD1 has a role to play in stem cells. So here I'm just showing uh, the hierarchical model of normal hematopoiesis. Um, and what I just showed you is that HECD1 cells were outcompeted in a number of cell types. So either HECD1 is playing a role in each one of these cell types, or if you follow back to um, a common ancestor, HECD1 could be playing a role in one of these cells. So we define these cells um, by facts, uh, and I've just got an example gating strategy here, which I've used the SLAM family of markers. Um, and at the top of the hierarchy, you have the long-term and short-term stem cells. So these, the properties of these cells, or how they're defined, is that they can contribute or, or generate all the mature cell types of the blood. Um, but they can also self-renew, and they're relatively quiescent. Uh, they can undergo asymmetric division and um, result in multipotent progenitors, and these are much more proliferative, can still generate all the different cell types, but can no longer self-renew. So they're only transiently able to do this. And then as we go along, you get um, more and more differentiation. So um, the hematopoietic Stem, uh, progenitor cells one and two um, start to have some lineage bias, and then eventually you get um, you split off into the myeloid and lymphoid lineages. Um, and it's probably worth noting with the advent of uh, single cell technologies, while I've uh, put each population as a single uh, discrete thing, it's likely that this exists as a continuum. So together, these uh, populations make up the LSK compartment, uh, and as you can see, these are the other populations which are discerned by CD48 and CD150. So again, I set up the competitive reconstitution assay to see if this lack of competitiveness went all the way back to uh, these populations. Uh, I aged the mice for a bit longer so that we could test the ability of the long-term stem cells to contribute. Um, and what you can see is that if you look at the hematopoietic stem cells in the um, control, you have the expected close to 50%, but they rapidly um, declined in the HECD1 knockout setting. And just quantifying this over these different populations, we see an average of about a third of remaining stem cells um, and multipotent progenitors, and this drops even further with the um, hematopoietic progenitor cells. So one easy explanation for this would be that there were just less stem cells to start with. I had never really characterized the fetal livers. All I was doing was counting the cells and transplanting equal number of cells into each recipient mice. So there could have been lower amount of hematopoietic stem cells in uh, the HECD1 embryos to start with. So um, firstly, there were less total cells in the fetal liver. Um, with the HECD1 knockouts compared to uh, wild type. Uh, but this didn't uh, equate to a loss of a particular population. It was just more that there were less cells generally over different populations. And I'm just showing uh, these ones, but they were true for more, um, more mature cells. 
Um, but more importantly, uh, the proportions that were the same. So the total number of uh, cells that I was transplanting contained the same amount of hematopoietic stem cells. So it wasn't, the lack of competitive wasn't due to the, um, there being less cells to start with. So we started thinking that maybe HEC-D1 was playing a role in the self-renewal of these cells, which is quite common to see um, them be outcompeted in a competitive assay. So we did some serial transplantation uh, uh, experiments to try and get to the bottom of this. So again, uh, if you take HEC-D1 fetal, uh, generate fetal livers, um, then you can transplant them into lethally irradiated mice, and this is at the primary transplant. But then you can uh, take these mice, harvest their bone marrow, and then retransplant them into newly irradiated mice. Uh, and this will be the secondary transplant. So um, if you have wild type cells, you can um, transplant them uh, into the primary, secondary, uh, tertiary, about four or five times before they become exhausted and can no longer uh, rescue lethality. So if HEC-D1 um, had a defect in self-renewal, then maybe we would see these mice drop out a little bit earlier. So I'm going to show you the secondary recipient, uh, some data from the second recipient mice, so looking at their bone marrow and just looking at uh, immunostaining and facts. Um, and this is non-competitively, so you can see uh, almost 100% reconstitution with the wildcat controls, um, but the HEC-D1 cells are dropping out quite quickly, uh, and so the rest of the bone marrow is made up from uh, remaining endogenous cells that, that escaped irradiation lethality. And if you look at the mature cell types, so T cells, the CD4, CD8s, B cells, and the uh, myeloid granulocytes, um, this carried right through to the mature subsets. So instead of doing a tertiary transplant, we decided to try and answer this question a bit differently. So again, doing a secondary transplant, but this time we um, transplanted diluting numbers of cells. And uh, we know that a million cells is more than enough to re rescue lethality of a radiated animal, um, with 100,000 cells uh, perhaps not being enough. And in the middle, we chose 200,000. So as expected, uh, if you transplant a million cells, they are, um, they are fine. So this is eight weeks post-transplant. Uh, we didn't see any mice uh, undergo reconstitution failure. But if you transplant 200,000 or 100,000 cells, um, comparing the wild type in uh, blue and the light blue is the HEC-D1 cells, um, these animals are much less likely to survive. And if you look at the animals that did survive, um, most of them have an outgrowth of endogenous cells and very little um, contributing HEC-D1 cells, HEC-D1 knockout cells. So, we don't really know what the process is that is responsible for the defects in the self-renewal of the HSCs, but it could be a number of things. I told you HEC-D1 was uh, important, or been shown to be a regulator of cell migration, so we thought maybe it could be uh, the niche, maybe the HEC-D1 cells can't get to the bone marrow as well, uh, or maybe once they're there, they can't um, maintain their space there, uh, and maybe intravital imaging could answer these questions. Uh, it could be that they can't proliferate as well, um, and this could be answered by doing BRDU pulse chase experiments in vivo. Um, or maybe they're proliferating too much and undergoing exhaustion. Um, and so this is uh, addressed in literature mostly by uh, treating mice with, again, 5-FU or sublethal irradiation and seeing how well they recover. Um, or this project could go full circle and apoptosis um, could be responsible. So um, maybe HEC-T1 cells are just more likely to die. And if that's the case, then um, we could probably rescue this with beam and puma knockout or um, Bax and back knockout. So while I don't have the answers to any of these questions yet, um, we did do one experiment, which I'll just finish with for the last few slides. Um, and we, did, we chose to do RNA sequencing um, which might be a bit counterintuitive because uh, HEC-D1 uh, regulates post-translationally. So normally when you're looking for substrates of an E3 ligase, you would turn to proteomics. But our phenotype was in um, a rare population of primary cells. And so we thought uh, it wasn't really feasible at this stage to do proteomics. So we thought we'd just like, throw a wide net of, uh, and do RNA sequencing on uh, LSKs. And maybe this way we could identify what pathways were 
uh, what, what pathways were changed as opposed to trying to find a specific substrate. So again, set up timed matings and generated uh, fetal livers. And this time we just, um, just took the whole LSK compartment. So this was the ones that contained the HSCs and multipotent progenitors. Uh, we did genome right RNA sequencing. So I took wild type and litter make um, HECD1 knockouts. And I took an equal number with and without exencephaly. So this was a co collaboration with uh, Stephen, who um, did all the sequencing and also makes it very easy for you to prepare your samples uh, for sequencing in his lab. Um, and also Connie and Alex, who did all the bioinform bioinformatic analysis uh, on my samples. So firstly, you can see that the wild type LSKs do express HECD1 and that these is ablated in the uh, knockout samples. And when you compare wild type with knockout, um, we got about 120 differentially expressed genes. Uh, and you can see that just on this differential expression plot uh, with all the significantly upregulated ones highlighted in red and significantly downregulated in blue. But we weren't particularly interested in identifying what each one was um, and uh, trying to find a substrate. We were looking uh, broadly at what pathways were affected. So Connie and Alex did pathway analysis on these differentially expressed genes. And what we got was unexpected, but also very striking. Um, and that is there was a high representation of um, innate immune response pathways. So this prompted Connie and Alex to look at, um, do gene set uh, analysis to look for any um, signatures. And what we saw is that with HECD1 knockout, um, we have increased interferon signaling signature. Um, and so the p-value is not adjusted, so it's only these really low values that were to be taken into account. So what is interferon? Um, something I've been learning about over the last month. Uh, interferons <laughs> are cytokines that are involved in the immune response, and they act by, um, th they signal through the JAK-STAT signaling pathway. Uh, and then the stat activated stat transcription factors can in um, induce the expression of um, interferon target genes. And this elicits an antiviral response. So what do interferons have to do with hematopoietic stem cells? Well, it actually didn't take much looking in the literature to show that um, abnormally increased interferon signaling results in a defect in self renewal. Uh, and this is usually due to um, the cells becoming exhausted. So interferon signaling resulted in increased proliferation um, and uh, prolonged proliferation resulted in uh, exhaustion of these cells. So this also prompted us to look um, at HECD1 at, in the interferon database, which is a really great resource out of the Hudson Institute. Um, and interestingly, we can see that the mouse and human locus uh, upstream has uh, STAT1 and also STAT3 binding sites, which uh, predicts that potentially HECD1 itself is an interferon-regulated re gene. So this brings me to my conclusion. Um, and this is kind of what we think is happening. So we have interferon signaling. And we think HECD1 is negatively regulating this pathway. But whereabouts on this pathway, we, we're not sure. And we think this because if you take away HECD1, you get increased interferon signaling. Uh, it, it increased induction of interferon um, in, um, regulated genes, um, and this, really, this results in reduced self renewal of HSCs. Um, so, also, we're interested in uh, looking at whether HECD1 is itself um, um, an interferon targeted gene. And um, moving forward, I guess, to validate this uh, involvement of HECD1 in this pathway, potentially we could rescue the phenotype by knocking out the receptor. Uh, oh, there's also a really good uh, receptor neutralizing antibody that, could, um, that we could use. And I mean, ultimately, moving forward, uh, we want to try and develop a model system where we can identify HECD1 substrates using um, a proteomic approach. So that brings me to my most important slide. Oh, settle in, everyone. <laughs> um, so firstly, Marco, Andreas, and Gemma, obviously my incredible supervisors. Um, like Marco said, I've been in his lab since um, a Europe student, and I think I knew after about two hours that I wanted to stay on for honors. Um, his unwavering 
uh, optimism is incredible and very inspiring, and he, um, yeah, he can turn any bad result into a more interesting good result. <laughs> <laughs> so there's also Andreas, who um, I spend a lot of time with, because some of you might not know this, but I actually sit in his office. Um, some might say that's a punishment, but it's been <laughs> a, actually a privilege. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and also Gemma um, jumped on board when I started my PhD and we've worked really closely on the MC01 project and Gemma has really helped me uh, stop doing 1,000 experiments and really think about what is the actual experiment that's going to answer the question to my problem. Um, also my PhD committee has been excellent and always felt like they were on my side. Um, Warren has been particularly helpful uh, when we started getting the stem cell phenotype. Um, and I've just highlighted in blue the people who have directly contributed to the projects, but of course I thank everybody in the Herald, uh, Strasser and Kelly Lab. Gemma technically doesn't have her own lab, but she might as well have. Um, everyone in MGC, and I've just noticed, um, noted some people that have helped um, by providing feedback and reagents and expertise. Um, the RNA sequencing, I said, was a collaboration with Stephen, Connie and Alex. Um, and numerous amounts of people at WeHi who um, have contributed to um, very, all my projects. Um, and I'm just pointing out Craig, who really shone the light on the black box of HSCs and spending an afternoon, afternoon with him really upped my fax game. Um, John, um, who I've gone through undergrad and Europe and honours <laughs> and PhD with, who's been uh, great for scientific chats, um, and also Grant, who helped with the MCL1 project. Um, bioservices, I do so, so much work with mice, and uh, Crystal has been the team leader in our room for the entire time. Um, and they're so professional, there's never any mistakes, and sometimes I have humongous experiments, and um, they always run really smoothly. Uh, administratively, all of these people make my life very easy. Catherine and Michelle are our division coordinators, uh, Lynn in the grants office, and Sue in the education office. Um, we also started talking to Paul, uh, who's giving us advice about the interferon stuff. Um, everyone who runs the bloods on the Advia and irradiates the mice. I spent a lot of time in the fax facility, um, so very grateful that everyone maintains those machines uh, and also get a lot of histology done. I've had some great mentors, so Ed and Delphine, and also uh, Anne and Doug, a lot from on my time on the committee, on the WESA committee, finances, and also my family and friends, so structural biology division, of which I've been in honorary member purely for social reasons, <laughs> and um, WESA and Wednesday Dumplings, who have all been a like, really excellent uh, place of support and camaraderie. Um, Ella and Christy, my chosen sisters, who have been around since I chose to go back to high school at 25, um, and Joe, my partner, who has put up with a lot of, particularly over the last couple of months, <laughs> um, but also it spends a lot of time understanding what I do coming from a non-scientific background, which means he's really there for the highs and lows. Um, I was very lucky to have a Leukemia Foundation scholarship and have um, uh, other financial benefits. I also worked in stores for a while and appreciated that very much. Um, and with that, I'll take questions. <laughs> Thank you, Max. I think there will be some questions. No one. You answered everything. <laughs> All right, Nick. Yeah, so if, um, if you have hypothesis, is that it's um, acting on the JAX deficit in the mouse population, is that expected to see much perturbation in the human body substance? Yeah, you mean like the sort of socks or the JAX deficient mice, and they see, well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, yes, I mean, well, the answer is we don't know yet, but maybe it's acting um, downstream. So there could be that it's not actually more interferon, it's um, that it could be downregulating something further down in the pathway, which might perturb the uh, response a little bit, potentially. <laughs> like I said, interferon's not my expertise yet. Yep, sure. How much of the interferon do you think is yeah, that's a really good question, something we've kept in mind. So um, 
We also don't know if um, there's increased interference signaling in the embryo, which is um, contributing to the phenotype. And also, yeah, with the radiation, there's increased interference, so that could uh, reduce the self-renewal. Um, but the only thing I can say is that after a primary reconstitution, these mice seem okay. So, um, and there's only a very small drop in CD45 point, uh, or like the donor cells um, after irradiation. So it's really only after secondary transplant where we see the defect. So. Ah, yes, Sue. Uh, so just following up on that, um, have you looked at vitro? Like, if you take the stem cells in vitro, the proliferation, then you know, in response to. No, I haven't, but yes. No, but definitely that's something we'll do um, in the future. We only got these results about a month ago, and I've been writing my thesis, so I've been banned for the lab for now. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we might even just try and make some HD1 knockout MEFs or some BMDMs and just try and work with a, a tissue, a cell type where we can get a bit more material, uh, maybe make a model system that way. But certainly I could sort LSKs and treat them um, with interferon and look at the response. I don't know whether this is a naive mouse question or not, but if you, when you knock out MCL1 in the NUMIC line, you get full protection, right? Uh, survival? Yes, so are you talking about Gemma's experiments? Yeah, yeah. yeah so those, that, that experiment was you took, um, she had MCL1 flux lines and she transplanted those cells into uh, mice and genetically deleted them using tamoxifen. Uh, and yeah, you get pretty much 100%. Um, uh, yeah, I was just wondering the difference between that and using the drug, which is pretty potent, you still see 25% of those. Yeah, I guess, cured, like, know? genetic deletion is absolute, yeah. uh, where if you're treating with a drug, it's only transiently. I actually don't know what the half-type life of the drug is in tissues, but it could also be about accessibility, so the, the, the ability for the drug to get to those um, critical cells that could give that difference in 30%. Did you look at the in vitro sensitivities of the emergent neumic to see whether No, I didn't. But I do have those tissues frozen down. I could see there could be some um, like compensating mechanism that is uh, yeah, that for the reason why the MCL1 inhibitor doesn't work in those cells. But yeah, no, I never I never looked at those. Um, the, the, the drug is six times more efficient in, in human, yes. the human version, but the, at least I think you showed that the human can interact with the ma other mouse yeah. molecules at a similar yep. efficiency. Do you know anything about that, the, presumably the active site and what's going on there, why the, the, the difference between those two? No, I don't think I can answer that question. It is a good question, though. I mean, I know like the drug does bind within the groove, where the BH3 only proteins bind, um, but maybe it's just a bit proximal, so, or maybe it just binds a bit, the, the activity needs to be not as quite as strong to give it its effect. Um, might be a question for the structural biologist. Um, so I'm just using HD cells, which is Yeah, this, that's the kind of advice that we were looking to get. <laughs> <laughs> at this seminar, I mean, that's... Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you about that afterwards. Okay. Um, looks like self-renewal is enhanced differentiation. Yeah. So, um, whether at earlier time points in the transplantation model or a reducible model, could it be that the HEC D1 knockout cell uh, I looked at, the earliest time point I looked at was four weeks. And four weeks, they're pretty much ablated already. Um, but I haven't looked any sooner than that. I don't know if those, if that would be at the time point you're referring to. Yeah. I was just uh, wondering why you used uh, four or five successive days of treatment for the uh, NCL1 mm. inhibitor and only one was the cyclophosphamide. I have an understanding of the pharmacokinetics as to why you did the serial treatment. 
Um, we, I guess I just used information that was available to me from previous experiments. So generally, uh, in the literature, if you're using cyclophosphamide, um, you'll get like one or two doses in mice. Um, and with the S63845, um, the five consecutive doses has been um, <coughs> the main, um, most successful treatment regime that we've used so far. Um, and I guess that moving forward, there are some other people who are starting to try and uh, move that out a little bit, so do like two consecutive doses over three weeks, say, more similar to venetoclax. But um, yeah, I haven't looked at those. But my feeling is actually you don't need all five doses. I think you probably only need two or three, yeah. <laughs> Any further questions? If not, then it remains the same. Mark.